Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming back to part two of our From po Prohibition to Populist class. Um, can you hear okay? Is that perfect? All right. Um, a couple of things, a little housekeeping details I, I need to, to read to you first. Uh, please turn off your cell phones or at least put them on silent mode. Um, we'll try to repeat questions if you have them from the class. Um, I will also encourage those of you who are in the, the class to feel free to use the microphone over to our side here to ask questions. Um, and also for those of you who um, may have questions and are, are viewing the class online, um, email us questions um, at lifelonglearning at wichita edu. That's lifelonglearning at wichita.edu. Um, so I also want to, uh, to mention that if you use the mic on this side, there should be a blue X with, with duct tape. Our, our painters paint up there, so you'll know where to stand to use the microphone. Um, also, we will take a break at two o'clock, um, and it'll be for just a few minutes type of thing. In terms of face coverings, um, per the latest university guideline, instructors presenting on stage do not need to wear a mask or face covering but students and visitors must wear face coverings over their mouths and noses while on all Wichita State University campuses. And that means in the hallways, the public spaces, classrooms, and other common areas of the buildings. Um, so I needed to read that part. I also, uh, before I introduce Tom, want to in some ways apologize for last week's class. You may have noticed I have sometimes difficulty pronouncing words, and that's because one of the med medications I'm taking now produces a symptom called cotton mouth, dry mouth. And so I just felt a little self-conscious every time I needed a drink of water, um, going through the face shield on it and taking a drink of water like chickens drink water, if you know what I'm saying. So. I thought you might find that kind of amusing. I hope anyway. I, I am so excited with our speaker today, Tom Giesel. Um, he's a farmer. How many generations are you? Fourth, Fourth generation, just like me, uh, Kansan. Um, his, uh, he farms in Pawnee County near Larnon. Um, he raises wheat, corn, milo, and alfalfa in partnership with his brother, Jay. And Tom has been active in the Farmers Union all of his life. He's served as vice president of the Kansas Farmers Union um, for nearly 20 years, and he has also served the Farmers Union on a national level as chairman of the policy committee, testified at congressional hearings, and participated in the American Farm Project and he currently serves as honorary historian for the National Farmers Union, and he's president of the Pawnee County Farmers Union. So I was really excited that Tom could join us today. And if you can, please silence your, your cell phone if you can. Um, thank you, and um, Tom, I would love for you to take away the class. Okay, Becky, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really pleased to be here today because if I was back home, I'd be picking corn, and I'd rather be here with you than not picking corn right now, to be honest. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping to begin with, and my wife reminded me of this this morning as we were doing our morning walk on this title slide. She said, you better explain about the farmer's advocate right away. And so I will, and it, it was a newspaper that started publication in 1879 in Topeka, Kansas, and went 
into the 20th century a little while, but what's kind of unique about it, it it's, uh, its popularity and it's, everything went just kind of with the, the People's Party and the populist movement in the rise and fall. And part of that's because the editor was an old populist. So anyway, so you're gonna hear quite a bit about the farmer's advocate in, in different stories and in different ways and how it ties into what generally about everything I'm gonna talk about. Um, Becky gave me a nice introduction. I need to update stuff a little bit. Uh, my brother and I no longer farm together. He's He went his separate way. He got divorced went his separate way, which which happens, that's fine. So now it's just my wife and I uh, farming in Northwest of Lonard, Kansas. And my wife and I have three children. They're all grown and, and far gone, Boston, Kansas City, and four grandchildren. My educational background is I, I attended Fort Hayes State University and have a BS in geology. So I worked as a geologist for a year. I grew up on a farm, got my BS in geology, I uh, did some work in that field for about a year, and then I came back to farm. And uh, my farm is just currently downsizing just a little bit more and more all the time. And part of that's a factor of age, because I'm 67 years old, and I don't want to do this until I die. I, and uh, and I want to make room for somebody else. Um, let's go to the next slide, Tad. Now, just briefly explain how I got into the, all of this. Um, of course, being a full-time farmer and a farm activist, kept really busy, but um, back in 2006, our Kansas Farmers Union organization was gonna celebrate a centennial, and they asked if I would go down to the Topeka, the Historical Society, and do a little research, and man, I got hooked. And uh, I just haven't stopped. So that's about 14 years now. And you can see I've got my own microfilm machine, I look at my own film. Um, that file cabinet's chucked full of thousands of documents. And it's mainly about our organization, the Farmers Union organization, which, uh, which I'm very much a part of, and, and my local community. And I, I really enjoy local history as well. So let's go to slide three. Uh, uh, the progressive farmer and the reason I put this up, well, a couple of reasons was just because of the progressive era, but that gentleman is wearing a, or reading a progressive farmer magazine. And actually that was the official organ, as they called him, of the North Carolina Farmers Union. And very, very progressive in nature and very, you know, with a lot of populist roots. And progressive farmers still published today. And if the people who are started that magazine see what's in it today they'd just jump out of the earth i mean they would really it would really they'd really be upset with what's being said but if you go back to those days i guess the reason i put that up that reading print was about the only information your information source back in the turn of the century or before you know radio didn't come in until the late 1920s and all the other forms of media and i've really been surprised in in um uh, in uh, reading just um, about all this stuff, just how much people craved information and the importance of newspapers. And that the fact that, well, one, they had to know how to read, but secondly, I think they took things in a little better. They weren't, they just didn't have stuff dumped on them. They had to seek it out. And many farm organizations were started by, a lot of populists, but started by um, uh, newspaper editors. And part of it was to sell newspapers. Um, they'd say, okay, you want to join this farm organization? By the way, once a month, you're going to get this newspaper. And it's going to be $2 a year for everything. And they'd take it. And I think a lot of people joined more for the news than they did for the farm organization. Um, not, but, but <clears throat> okay, the, the newspapers, I, I throw this slide up too, just about the importance of it. Um, I, the farmer's advocate was much like, if you're familiar at all, farm publications, there's one called the High Plains Journal or G Grass and Grain, their general farm, uh, general farm papers. And, and <clears throat> what happened was, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but the, 
the organization that started ahead of Farmers Union was called the Farmers Alliance and Industrial Union. And I'll get to that in just a minute. But they, um, um, oh, excuse me, I got way ahead of myself. So, so the, the Farmers Alliance, they would, they would associate with a newspaper to get their information out. And when the Farmers Alliance went down, um, eventually, well, not, I mean, not the Farmers Alliance, but the, but the Populist Party, um, they, they wanted to resurrect the Farmers Alliance. And the Farmers Alliance that was turned into the Farmers Union. And they, um, they, the Populist editors of newspapers, and there were a lot of, a lot of newspapers across the country that had a Populist tilt to them, would offer two to three pages in, in every issue to promote the Farmers Union. Uh, in fact, that's how I discovered it. I was up at Topeka. I'd been reading a lot in our in our Farmers Union papers back in the single digits, 1905 to 1915, and they kept talking about the advocate, the advocate. And so finally, I was down there and I saw they talked about the farmers' advocate. So I grabbed a roll of that microfilm and just spun it on the machine a little bit. When it stopped, it had a photograph of our national Farmers Union president, which was quite a find by accident. But that led me into a whole other perspective of not only a farm organization, but also populism in general and how these things merged. And, you know, we were very agrarian back at that time. So the populist movement and the, and the progressive uh, parties were very closely associated with agriculture and farming. Uh, and, it was and Tom, forgive yeah. me. How close of a time period was that before, like, co-ops came about? Okay, I'm going to talk about co-ops in a little bit. I, well, I'll, I'll talk a little bit now, and we'll get to a little bit more. But cooperatives, we think, when we think of cooperatives, we generally think of farm cooperatives. But there are all kinds of cooperatives. You know, savings and loan is a cooperative. Uh, you have, uh, well, I think uh, True Value Hardware is a cooperative, actually. They're a little bit different forms, but... Cooperatives, the principle of cooperatives started back in about the 1840 or so in England, and it was by the weavers. And they knew that they were being taken advantage of. So they they put their put their heads together and their act together to act cooperatively. And they come up with a, 10 principles called the Rockdale principles, which are the basis of co-ops. <clears throat> co-ops, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, um, they will they're different than a corporation, much different. And you vote, you just vote your person, you don't vote your stock. So, and we'll get into that, but but the farmers, um, this, this all, cooperatives kept trying to come in existence. The Grange is the oldest farm organization, by the way, started right after the Civil War, actually by the government to try to do something for <clears throat> Southern agriculture after it was absolutely demolished. But um, everybody wanted to start a cooperative because they felt like they were being taken advantage of by the big trust, the big corporations on both the, the buying and the selling. And um, so many started and almost all failed. And the reason they failed was they didn't have uniform cooperative law uh, on, either on a state or a, on a federal level. And this happened later on with the advocacy of of farm organizations. They were never capitalized enough. There was no education about how a co-op functioned. And all of these things led to failure. And it wasn't until actually when Farmers Union came along after the turn of the century, in the last century, that they advocated for all these changes. And then actually it became le totally legal with the Capra-Volstead Act of I think 1922 or three and Arthur Capper, Senator Capper was from Kansas and Volstead from Minnesota, put together legislation that enabled farmers to collectively buy, sell, and do things together. Uh, very much a, a progressive populist concept. And, um, and, and they really took off. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's, and I'll talk a little bit more, I'll have a little more explanation about the, about the populist or the, cooperative thing here in a, in a little bit. Um, but anyway, these, these papers 
were were the lifeblood of of rural America. You know, newspapers, and I want to talk about them a little bit too at some point. But newspapers, the U.S. Postal Service allowed papers to go back and forth at very little cost, and was it was for the purpose of educating the public, and we traded that information. Uh, and just about anybody could could start a newspaper, and just about anybody did. So, uh, but <clears throat> they're fascinating to look at. In fact, I've I've really come across a, a really good fortune uh, a while back when a, a local institution had a set of papers and of newspapers from Pawnee County, uh, incomplete set, but they were had to do something with them. Besides, they couldn't sell them. They didn't want to take them to the dump. But I've got the news, most, I'd say 60% of the newspapers of Pawnee County between 1874 and 1970. So I have these stored in a special building out in my shed. And so I think I'll spend the rest of my life reading newspapers. I'll tell you what, there's some damn good ones too out there. And they're, they're just fun to read. Um, I'm gonna digress a little bit on that newspaper business because you know, in the in those early days, it's it's really fascinating to read about the, all these things, but it's hard to imagine how many newspapers every county had, and they'd come and go. I believe Pawnee County, you know, Lawnard has had something like twenty three or four different newspaper titles, just amazing. We only had two that really in modern day, but. Um, if you get really bored sometime, you can find History of Kansas newspapers that was written in 1916 and list them all by county and by town. And then also list many of the editors, which which is, is pretty interesting in and of itself. Um, so I don't know what else I want to say about about the newspapers, except that was that was where they got their information. That's where, you know, they printed. They That's where they were published. I, um, people were published. You know, I I enjoy my farmers union papers especially because they, people would write in what we maybe call blogging now, but they'd write essays, and there's some of the most wonderful essays, heartfelt essays from people that you you just it's just jaw dropping. Like uh, you know why we farm, and you read this and it just about brings tears to your eyes, and you could read it today. And then there was another one. Another essay that, that kind of comes to mind, and um, it was it was called Dreams. And if you'd read that, you'd think that maybe Martin Luther King read that before he wrote his too, because there was a lot of parallels, but talking about the same type thing. So what it really goes to show is that you know that the issues don't change. The um, there's a lot of things that don't change. Um, but what does human nature doesn't change? But what does change is uh, the date on the calendar and people's resolve to do anything about this. And that's what happened happened with uh, with political parties. And since we're kind of keying on populism and maybe the People's Party, especially happened with them. So we'll go to the next slide and another farmers advocate slide. And I, I just picked this headline out. I know William Allen White wasn't a a populist or it wasn't a people's party. Hmm? He, was not. he was not. But I love the headline where it says, Millionaires, greatest failure in modern life, says William Allen White. <laughs> that sounds like a populist to me that talks about this. So these papers every week would have this section. They'd have it all, you know, it was a 24 page weekly paper, which was quite an undertaking. And once again, on the newspapers, <clears throat> You know, they had to set all that type and set all that print. So there was ne wasn't necessarily a lot of fluff. I mean, if you're going to go through all that trouble, you're going to make it worth your time on what you're going to print, what you're going to write, what you're going to share. So anyway, let's move on uh, to the next slide. And the cartoons, and I'm sure many of have, you have, have seen the cartoons of the, of the populist age. And this particular one, I know it's hard to read or hard to see, but it's about the commons, and you know, meaning the things that we share in common. And on the on the left hand side, it shows the person sitting in jail because they shot a goose off the commons, which it probably was out of season or whatever. 
But on the right hand, they show the very wealthy landowner that literally stole the commons from the people and, um, you know, got by with it. Um, it says, but turns the, the greater villain loose who steals the common from the goose. And there's the old populist cartoons are just, they just abound. Um, there's a pretty good book, or a very good book by Worth Robert Miller, Populist Cartoons. And it's just full of these cartoons. And also he talks about the progress or the populist party and, and its demise. And if you're really interested in that, it's, it's really a pretty good read. I enjoyed it. It, it brought a lot of things together for me. Tom, so, yeah. you know, one thing that it's been a question that some of the students have had, what would be considered good reading material to kind of acquaint people with the whole populist movement um, and also maybe even with prohibition? Because they, in some ways, they, they go hand in hand. They really do. And, you know, I'm going to have to admit that I probably can't answer that question very well. I I kind of back I kind of yeah, it's hard. I kind of backed into this whole thing, studying my farmers union group, and and I, I've learned backwards about all these things. And so, so I really don't know. I've my information I've gotten is from reading old newspapers, and nobody has the time except a farmer that doesn't have livestock anymore in the winter can sit there for months and months and look at these things. And um, you're right, the populism and the, and the prohibition go hand in hand. Um, I read about the prohibition thing all the time, all the time in the papers. I mean, even locally, I, I can tell stories. Of course, I'm old enough. I remember my dad buying, telling how he used to buy booze from a bootlegger and, you know, the names of the local people that did it and how, you know, they would they would have their pickup in a culvert out in a field two miles from town and and on and on and on. And, it, it you know, it seems like it shouldn't have been that long ago, but it really probably was. He told me one time, he said, the worst thing he ever come across buying booze from a bootlegger, he said he was out of everything but prune wine. And he said, I only did that one time. So, so but, uh, but yeah. Um, and then even in, in a, and I know, well, it, it, it fits. Um, locally, you read in the paper, there was always this inference about people getting booze, and it was always the people that, you know, the higher class, quote, people in town, and they'd, they'd kind of keep that on the hush-hush, but, but not really. And they'd talk about neighboring towns and bringing it back and forth. There was an outdoor dance pavilion and recreation area in the southwest, just outside the city limits, along it coincidentally, and called Shady Grove. And I've done a program on this. It's really fascinating what they did, but I mean, all the fun they had and all the recreation. But one of the things that really happened out there is you, that's where you went to get your booze or party and have fun. It finally got shut down because um, for a brief time because that particular township, the three township officers' wives put the pressure on them to close it down and they got it closed down. So another theory, maybe somebody else can answer this a lot better than I can, but, but the whole prohibition thing and alcohol thing, I had one guy tell me it's tied to Henry Ford and the automobile because of the fuel thing and the oil companies and they didn't want to make alcohol available for fuel for vehicles. And I don't know if there's any truth to that, but it almost would make sense that we just need to shut this whole alcohol thing down. And it wasn't just from drinking, it was from, and the oil company used, used that as pressure to use more oil. So whether it's true or not, I don't know. But, but yeah, prohibition and, and this does go hand in hand. There's, they're just absolutely, absolutely no doubt about it. <clears throat> but getting back to the, um, the cartoons, I, I'd, I'd recommend that book. And it's, it's fun to read, and they were pretty sassy about it. In a little bit, I'll, uh, maybe it's, um, yeah, let's go to the next slide, Tap. And um, this, I pulled this out of our local paper. By the way, the Tiller and Toiler, 
is the newspaper of Longer, Kansas. Now, you can imagine that's a populist paper, the farmer and the laborer, the tiller and the toiler. That paper started in 1892 in Lawnard. A.A. Uh, a. Durer, and a few of you may know the Durer family, they, they hardware, tractors, metal products, did everything. Anyway, he was an old populist, and he convinced this uh, McMahon, who had the tiller, it was actual paper in Indiana, to move to Lawnard. He had to promise him 500 subscriptions, give him $500 cash, and by golly, he did it. And... Um, when it came to town, it kind of rocked the town quite a bit because he, he would print all this stuff. And sad thing was he died about four or five years later, but the paper continued to go on. <clears throat> but was, as you read these papers, it just, I love, and I know you can't see this on the screen, but I'm going to, there's 77 reasons I'm a populist. And they list them, and it's pretty, some of it's pretty fun reading. Um, but I'm going to read you the top 10 out of there that I thought, were, were pretty good. Uh, the second one was because I want better wages and I want all laboring men to have better wages. Then the next one was because it is a party of the common people as opposed to bank and corruption rule. rule. Next one, because the populist party is engaged in educating the common people on their rights and duties as honest citizens. Because it teaches cooperation instead of war and slavery of the many to the few. Because it teaches the responsibility of people for their own government. Well, don't they sound great? I mean, I think they do. Um, because it believes that laws for protection of the American people are more important than laws for the protection of the trust and the encouragement of foreign investors. I love populism because of the enemies it has made. <laughs> that's, that's, I like that one. I love populism because it believes in government for the benefit of the people now on earth. I love populism because it was organized by useful and industrious members of society who are opposed to being robbed, period. <laughs> and I'm a populist because I don't think it pleases God for the laborer to be content with the situation in life to which greed and arrogance have seemed fit to call him. So I've, if you ever if want a copy as I've, I've emailed a, a copy to, to Becky and um, it's, it's, you, it? you know, or I we I'll, can send it out. Yeah. And I can, I can give you my email address too, but um, several of these things, they would, they would talk. They had another article, old, party dictionary which goes through these things and they just just really hit on these on these money people but <clears throat> the tiller and toiler was was just a fantastic there were many populist leaning newspapers in the in the state of kansas and i think the state historical society lists them separate or in, in the ones that are there which which make for some very interesting reading i think if they the old populist in Lawnard would see that my name, my paper today, they would jump out of their graves because it's they won't recognize it. But that's that's life, and that's the way it goes. Tom, yeah. What I'm wondering is, I know uh, a couple of you have sent me emails, and I was wondering if you would share. Um, you had grandparents that were members of the populist party um, or great grandparents and um, just wanted to, to see if you could do like a raise of the hand type of thing. No, no one in here? I know some of you are online who probably did. Um, please feel free to share your stories, your family stories on that. And I think I shared Last week, last week that my grandfather, my um, grandparents were very much into the populist movement, and they named their firstborn son James Weaver uh, Tanner, uh, in part because James Weaver was the presidential candidate um, in, was it 1893? Two? Two. Two, two yes. Um, 
So I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm not an expert on, on the People's Party too much, but, you know, in Kansas, we had a governor, Llewellyn, a, you know, a populist governor. We had some populist in the legislator, legislature. We were hopping and going for a little while. In a little bit, I'm going to explain what I think kind of happened and, and why it all, why it all uh, kind of fell apart a little bit. So anyway, uh, the populist party in Laundry, Kansas, and in other places in the state, it's amazing when you start looking at this, you'll see places like Hugoton, Kansas, you see all these different sp hot spots for populism. And a lot of it's just where wherever there was a, a really good activist, where there was a newspaper to carry that information. Case in point, Medicine Lodge was a key place. That was where sockless Jerry Simpson was from. And um, do any of you know the story of why he was called that? It, a large part of it was because he had campaigned as a populist and said that the candidate running against him was so rich he could afford silk stockings. And if people noticed, he did not have any. And so suddenly, and it was a Wichita Eagle reporter, I might add, that then coined the term sockless Jerry Simpson. And the Medicine Lodge um, post office suddenly was inundated with stockings for Jerry Simpson. Um, he was an interesting guy. Um, he... Um, dies on a train and his only hope was to get back to Kansas and he dies as the train enters Kansas type of thing. So it's really kind of an interesting story. McPherson is another hotbed of populism. Um, where are some others that you can think of? Uh, I think, was it Anthony down in there? Um, oh, Belleville, Republic County. Real, real hotbed. I mean, it was sprinkled all around. So, and you know, getting back to the news, and well, I like to talk about sockless Jerry Simpson. He was a, he was a character. He ran, got, I think, elected twice and defeated. Then he ran again, and got reelected. Then he went to New Mexico to kind of finish out his life. But, but he was a very, very colorful character um, indeed. And newspaper editor and in uh, the Kinsley graphic, he and his wife, or his wife and her husband knew him. And she, in her book, she talks about her interactions with sockless Jerry Simpson. So these, these people were around and did, did wonderful things. Um, so yeah, um, made me think of some other things and that's, yeah, we'll, but we'll just go on here a little bit and come back to it. So, okay, let's go to the next slide, Matt. Okay, this, this is a photograph of a lapel badge, F, A, and I, U. That's Farmers Alliance and Industrial Union. Farmers Alliance and Industrial Union. And uh, it was started in 1878, actually in Kansas, briefly. Then, and it's farm organization, but closely aligned with labor. And then... Went to New York for a little bit, but really got going in Texas. And it's, like I say, it's a pre, it's a forerunner of Farmers Union, and very, very popular at at its peak. It had, it had about a, almost two million members, which is unprecedented for a farm organization. And actually, there was two alliances. There was the Southern Alliance and the Northern, and that was all based on. Um, uh, segregation race there and we were actually part more of the northern alliance than, than the south but they eventually eventually merged uh, I throw that up there because really it came before obviously before the the populist and the people's party and um, what I, I'll what happened was it got to be so powerful that the politicians moved in and usurped that energy and took it from them and left them high and dry. Because I tell you one thing that goes on in farm organizations. I've been around long enough to know that you should, and the early farmers union people were real strict about not endorsing 
a candidate or a party at all, because it's the same probably as true today. The people that agree with you already agree with you, and the people that didn't know now hate you. So you you gain nothing. And what it did to the to the farmers alliance when they started to align with a political party, it it wrecked. It just ruined them. It's everybody went home mad and stayed mad. So go to the next slide. Um, this particular cartoon, if you look close, that fork that he's using has the alliance written on it. And I know it's a little bit hard to read, but the three characters that in the, he's clearing them out are the, the one on the left is the, the boodle politician. The center is corrupt office holder. And on the right is a speculator. And so they were going after him. And the, and the farmers at that time, those were their arch enemies. They, they just despised, despised all those people. Um, they got very powerful because of this, the, uh, the alliance, or yeah, the alliance did. But like I say, ultimately, the, the politicians moved in. They could see that power, and, and they actually took it from them. You know, there's, there's a, a handful of things, in my opinion, that the items that diminish an organization or a movement. Because you think some of these things would go on forever, but they don't. And usually one is politics, either internal or out external. Um, that or they align with the political party. And I'll guarantee you that'll, that'll ruin you. And um, they, they end up physically removing themselves from their membership. They get so big, they move their headquarters away. And people in organizations want to be, want to be um, close to their, to their membership, close to their office. But ultimately, probably what ends most movements and organizations is success. Because like for farmers, once you got a good price for your grain, I don't need to belong. I don't need to be, I don't need to work with my neighbor. I don't have to do this. And it doesn't have to be farmers. It can be anybody. Once you reach, achieve success, it makes it very difficult to hold things together. That's why in cooperatives, and I'll talk about maybe if I remember a little bit later too, but, but why cooperatives, once they got going good in the 20, early 20th century, they set aside up to sometimes 5% of their profits for educational purposes to educate their own membership of why they exist. They said, if you didn't, within three or four years, people forget why we're doing this. And especially if you're successful and that, that shows up. Um, okay, let's go next slide. This, this is one of my favorite stories. You know, I, I talk about they having these wonderful stories in, uh, in the newspapers. This is 1905. When I was going through my microfilm, usually I went to page three, four, and five, because that's where the Farmers Union items were. But I always look at the, the main head, headlines too. And I saw this, I said, the people versus Smiley and the Grain Trust. And <clears throat> this happened in Rush County, right north of Pawnee County, uh, an issue that goes on even today when, when you sell grains they call it the margin. That's how much the speculator or the, the trader will take. And that can get out of whack for a number of reasons. But a lot of times they're just skinning a person. So what was happening is EJ Smiley was the president of the, of the Kansas Feed and Grain Dealers. I think it was the name of the association. He's out at Otis or Bison, Kansas, little dot on the map. And they were... Uh, they were fixing the price of grain. They had a 22 cent margin on wheat and it should have been maybe 10 cents at most. And <clears throat> they saw that happen because they had another elevator on the street that wasn't near as bad. And so they, they've come across, and this is a populist thing, back in the middle 1890s, Kansas passed a law, it's called 
Fraley or Frawley's antitrust uh, legislation. And so the sheriff chased them all the way back to Topeka and arrested them, brought them back, and they tried them on price fixing. And by golly, Rush County convicted him. And so he appealed it to the state Supreme Court. Guess what? State Supreme Court said they upheld it. They said, nope. It got appealed to the United States Supreme Court, a case in Rush County, Kansas. And the Supreme Court of the United States said it was lawful and they upheld it. So he had to come back and serve time in jail. The fine, I think, was 500 bucks. And that, that's where that second headline, and that's the one I just loved. I mean, this got to be a populist newspaper. Grain Trust Secretary throws a fit, then goes to jail. <laughs> I mean, you know, they just stuck it right in his face. So anyway, he ended up going to jail for six months. But they allowed him, not the farmers, but they allowed him to set up his grain trading business in jail. So he was trading grain while sitting in jail, which is just amazing. And uh, he actually then appealed to Governor Hawk of Kansas at that time to have to be pardoned. And in another one of these papers, over 400 people signed a petition and it listed everybody's name and sent it to Governor Hawk and said, keep him in jail. By God, they did. So the activism of the Populist Party was huge then because, you know, the trust and the corporations now, you couldn't touch them. If they did, they'd, they'd better get a slap on the hands or they'd be released. But back then, they, they put them in jail. But <clears throat> once again, that comes back to my Farmer's Advocate magazine or newspaper. And I just, like I say, just love reading the headlines. It's something new, new every day. But, but, um, that was a story of Smiley, and, and, and that shows how people felt empowered. I mean, of all things, Rush County, Kansas, you know, small western Kansas County, that they had the initiative to go ahead and try to prosecute, and they did prosecute, and they stuck with it all the way through the United States Supreme Court to keep this guy in jail. Do you think that happened today? I just doubt it. I mean, on a lot, on a lot of different levels. So, so that's my, and by the way, I still read about E.J. Smiley in 1931. He was still trading grain. That's like 25 years later and kind of just probably laughing in everybody's face. So, you know, as, as much as you like to think he has success, it's, it's really, really difficult. But, you know, if you don't do anything, don't expect anything. And those people knew they had to do do something about all that. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Now, I'm gonna kind of shift gears a little bit. I bet you've been thinking I've been shifting gears a lot, but, but talk about the farmers movement and farm organizations a little bit more. And this, this title, it says, let the words be agitate, organize, educate, and cooperate. And the reason I put that up, that were the that was kind of the calling of the Farmers Union. And, and Farmers Union started and resurrected in 1902 when, when a lot of the old alliance uh, organizers didn't want to give up, and then they finally resurrected the organization. But they said you had to do it, and, and those words have different meanings too. Uh, when they talk about agitate, what they really were talking about was get people fired up, get people enlightened, when you agitate for something, you, you, you're you trying to trying to get people in gear and say, hey, come on, you got to do something. So he said, first you agitate, then you organize. And he said, the, and the leaders always said, the first thing you need to do is organize their hearts. He said, and then their minds. And then he said, after you have them organized, then you educate and ultimately cooperate. Then you can cooperate. You can't, you can't cooperate until you go through those other steps. Um, the um, Farmers Union had quite a system of, of membership when they, when they started working, uh, working membership in an area, they would, um, 
the organizers first would go out would be a lecture and they go to town and they give a speech and get people to come and listen and um, then they'd send these organizers out in the country and they'd sign people up it was a dollar initiation fee and 25 cents a year dues and once they got 15 members they could form what they call a local and those locals were always established around the schoolhouse because that was a social center where people got together, so on and so forth. Um, but the organizer got to keep $13 of the 15, turn in the dues and give the other two to the local organization. So there was a lot of incentive for these people to go out. And that was a pretty good living. The, the saying was doing well by doing good. So, um, uh, but anyway, that's, that's how they they started this up and and it's a matter of timing with just about any organization if you have success when you start because they were working at that time on the price of cotton and they said if we do this it should make the price of cotton go up two cents and lo and behold it went up two cents but it didn't have anything to do with farmers union it had to do with some other forces but everybody believed it did so everybody everybody joined <clears throat> but the really powerful thing i think about the way the organization was set up, and I think it'd be very powerful today for any organization, was that they met, of course, they met at the schoolhouse because you didn't travel much. There were no good roads or very, really no automobiles then. But um, they met in small groups. And later, Farmers Union president talked about the, the power of meeting in small groups. And it was in a speech he called Organizing for Democracy. And he said, you know, in a small group of, you know, 10, 15, 20 people, he said, everybody has a chance to say something and speak their mind or I agree or don't agree. As opposed, he said, to mass meetings where nobody can speak at all. You're just listening. And he compared that to actually back then to like Nazi Germany, that they'd have these huge rallies and it was all, you see all this, boil and people you know just excitement and just you know these huge rallies but nobody was talking everybody was just listening and the power of democracy and the power to build communities and to do all these things really revolves around the ability for people to exchange ideas and to exchange thoughts in a in a very meaningful matter they had many local activities and which i you know, when I first started reading about some of the things they would do, I thought, well, I guess you have to do something like they'd have music or, you know, games and all that. But but the fact of the matter is, those are very real activities. And do, food. And food. And recreation. And I'm going to delve off a little bit about recreation. We had an ed education leader, a, a man in the 1930s from, from uh, Michigan, Chester Graham, who talked about the importance of recreation. And I thought, well, that's interesting because I know my dad didn't think I needed to have much fun. <laughs> I always worked on the farm, but, but uh, he said, recreation, he said, yeah, I'm paraphrasing. He said, recreation, he said people, and that's true today, people confuse that with entertainment. He said, for instance, he said, entertainment's when you go to the ball game. Recreation's when you play in the ball game. You participate. He said, true recreation is participatory in nature. So they would do that at their meetings. They'd have recreation that was participatory. He also said that, that when you engage in true recreation, you fix some things that are broken inside of you. Which, you know, I mean, it's, uh, to me, that's thought provoking. And think about what true recreation is. You know, it may not be quote, fun and games, but it's recreation. You know, recreation may be working in a garden. And, you know, garden can be hard work, but it, but it, actually it's recreation if you do it right. So so these small groups all over the country were, were engaging, having these meetings. And, and in the early days, of course, early, early days, the meetings were secret, were kind of a secret society, but, but that changed over time. Um, but... That's a fascinating thing. And that's how, in a way, how cooperatives, in one sense, um, come into play a little bit. But I want to say one more thing about about that that whole concept of of um, getting together and, and 
with your neighbors because we learned how to trust our neighbors and we learned how to engage with neighbors. And why is it that today people will listen to somebody a thousand miles away, somebody they never know, and they will take that and just eat it up. They'll, they'll just believe it. They'll, they'll consider it the God all in all these things. But if they talk to the neighbor, it's like, you're stupid. You're crazy. You know, and where, where, where have we gone wrong on this deal? So um, I think I think that's really important. And I think that's why they were very, very, very successful. You know, um, they knew how to create communities because they didn't have one. They created their communities. They created their communities around a lot of things. They created it around recreation for one, but around education. They created it around work. They created it around their business enterprise. And it had all had to happen from scratch. And and they they did this marvelous, marvelous job. And um, so anyway, let's go to the next slide. I've, or do we need to take a break? Yeah. Huh? What, why don't we take a small okay. break? I will say right before you go, I want to give a plug to a documentary that's on PBS right now. And if you get a chance to watch it, please do. It's called What's the Matter with Kansas? And it's a look at William Allen White, his life. And the thing that makes it so relevant to what we're talking about here is how he responded with all these grassroots movements. And I just think you would all find it wonderfully um, um, entertaining and knowledgeable and all of those things. Let's take a small break. We'll come back in about five or 10 minutes. And please let us know if you have questions, okay?
Thank you for coming back. I um, I think we're we're getting some good questions and and uh, comments. Uh, one of the things, Tom, uh, someone had brought up during the break, of what were some of the issues? Were there things that went beyond finances that the populists were going for, and also? How inclusive were they? Would African Americans have been a part of this, or Jewish or Catholic families? Was it predominantly Protestant? Protestant? Um, what? Who were the the folks who made up the populace? You know, once again, I'm going to be honest that I can't give you a really good, solid answer on that. But, but more than likely, more than likely, they were, they were probably segregated. Actually, our farmers union group was segregated in name because of the southern states. Because in our, uh, I've got an old constitution and bylaws. It talks about who can be members, and they, 16 years old, and they specifically say white, but then they make an exception for Indians. And the reason was because India, Homa and Oklahoma, that movement was so strong there that they did. But Kansas never was that way. We, we sent a delegate to the National Farmers Union Convention in 1921, uh, a black, can or black man as our, our delegate, when it was not even legal to be a member of supporting. And it caused quite a ruckus, but after it all went over well. So, so that, was, that was the case. But I really can't answer about the, the makeup of a populist. What I kind of bring today is how agriculture, how I think actually agriculture kind of formed, or, you know, it grew out of there and grew inside of it. And it kind of like a cancer, it ate it up in the end. So, so I, I'm sorry, I can't really speak to that. Well, and one thing I might add is after the ebb and flow of the populist movement, keep in mind, Kansas then has a powerful surge of, of the KKK. And um, that certainly takes, um, you know, yeah. it, it rises quite a bit. Um, that's why I love this documentary on what's the matter with Kansas, um, because it talks about how William Allen White, some of the editorials he did, and also the rise of popularity with John Brinkley, the goat gland doctor, and when he ran for governor, how... Um, how many people just um, were gullible and, and followed yeah. along with, with his political thoughts and that kind of thing. While we are on this topic, Marie, you had sent me um, a comment, an email from last week, and I was wondering if you would mind explaining a little bit about the Halderman Juliuses and the connection that um, those that uh, family members would later go on and do? Because I think it's an excellent point, and I think it's well worth noting. Again, all of this is from Kansas. You threw me a curve, Becky. <laughs> I don't know much how much I'll remember but uh, Becky talked about the little blue books that were published by Marcet uh, Hollerman Julius. And uh, I sent Becky an email. I said, did you know that Marcet was a niece of Jane Adams, A-D-D-A-M-S, of the Hull House? And she was a very uh, social activist. So the niece came by it naturally. And uh, as you said, those little blue books were so reasonably priced, low at 10 cents each, that it gave the general public a way to, to read. Absolutely. And, and, you know, again, I am always amazed at how all of this starts in Kansas and moves on. So. Very good. And thank you for your comments. That's very true. I want to go back, right? We talked about grassroots, right? And I, and I happened to bring along an article <clears throat> that is from the Leonard Chronoscope newspaper in 1935. It actually 
the story relates back to about 1900, but it said, origin of the term grass roots. Because we always hear about grass roots. And I, I have a theory on it too, but, but uh, it goes on here to say, we have no idea when and where the term originated, but its entrances into Kansas political parlance dates back to Kansas, a Kansas Day speech of the late Mort Albaugh. In memory, if our memory serves us correctly, Albaugh said that there was a legend of, of the prairies to the effect that if the jackrabbit placed an ear to the grass roots, it could hear the approach of its arch enemy, the coyote. Albaugh advised his Republican brethren of Kansas to keep an ear to the grass roots of the people's thoughts and thus learn public sentiment affecting political issues made and in the making. I so, want a copy of that. Okay. We're, we're, I think I think it's I've got I've got copies of stuff I got in my files I got one that's called fun stuff I mean it's well how do you how do you categorize some of this stuff and it just just other things like that and my wife said you know if somebody she said, something happens to you and somebody looks at this they're just going to shake their head but but I have a lot of electronic files too so okay let's I'm going to buzz through some of this because I think we need to hopefully get some questions and, and I want to get through the rest of this PowerPoint. Uh, on the screen, you see Owen Franklin Dornblazer. Uh, he was what I call the 11th man of Farmers Union besides the 10 founders, but he probably did more to promote. He was an old populist and actually from Texas, but traveled the United States working on things. And his, his saying was, you know, you can't help yourself without helping the other fellow. And see, I think that's the difference. We hear we hear about populist and you know movement of today, and when we think back, I think we're talking about two way different things. I mean, just way different things. And just my observation after reflecting on this, I think that the populist movement of the 1890s was more for the collective common good, whereas today I think a lot of people in populist, when they think populist, it's all about the individual. They don't think about anybody. But well, it's good for me. I'm 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 gonna. I'm going to be a rabble rouser. I'm going to do all these things, but it isn't about my community. It's about me. So I think I think that's a little bit different. But these populists, and I could, I just sometime I need to give a talk just on this guy. He was, he read Greek philosophy to no end. When I read some of his stuff, I'm going, holy cow, how ignorant am I? I mean, and these guys had to sit there, and they talk about sitting by the fireplace at night or a kerosene lantern to read. I mean, it was work if they were going to educate themselves, and they did it. But these people, you know, they they kept they they when the Populist Party or the People's Party went down, they didn't die out. We had a national secretary, A. C. Davis, who is from Missouri, but wonderful speeches that they transcribed. And I'm just going to read the excerpt out of one from 1924. He said, "We are beset on every hand by fellows." wanting to destroy the movement among the farmers. Regardless of all the talk handed out to you, there is not much more sympathy for the farmer today than there was 21 years ago. Don't let any flatterer pat you on the back and make you think there is. One of the troubles with the farmer is we have been ready to sit at the feet of demagogues and vote for them. You know that they are lying, but you like to hear them do it. When are you going to stop liking it? I just think that's a classic line. When are you going to stop liking it? And you know, you, you just see that. That I mean, people just take it in. So anyway, um, one other thing I guess I want to touch on, just because of, of the populist day and when they're what we think of isolation, you know, so much. And it was isolation. And I I've, I've reflected on this a lot because uh, here I'm out in Western Kansas. I spent a lifetime really of isolation too because. As our farms have got bigger, the equipment bigger, more technology, whatnot, I can farm more acres. I've actually, we, we went back the other way. We, we were isolated, we got to be more social, and that's what we really work for. And now I think about how isolated I am, that I don't rely on a neighbor to help me farm, to help me do much of anything, unfortunately. I, my, I do have one neighbor and I work a lot together. But it takes it even a step farther on the isolation issue you know, when nowadays, when, when farmers get in a piece of equipment, you know, there's so much technology, and there's another backstory to this, but that 
you're in an enclosed cab, which I like, believe me, I like, so don't, don't but, but I'm isolated. I'm isolated from other people. I'm, I don't smell anything. I don't feel anything. I don't taste anything. I don't experience all those, all those things that I think farmers and people, not just farmers, but, but people in general like to do. They like to put their hands in the soil. They like to smell the fresh turned soil or you know all those experiences that make it make it so great. So not only am I enclosed in that cab, I can go through an entire harvest if I don't have a problem, mechanical problem or computer problem, but a mechanical problem with a piece of machinery, I could probably harvest 60,000 bushel of corn and never touch a kernel. Now, how did that isolate me from what, what I am and who I, who I am? In fact, you take it a step farther with the new technology, I don't touch the steering wheel I don't control the planning depth. I don't, all these things I don't know. So in a sense, we have become more isolated. We went, we went the full circle and, and we're, we're back to some form of isolation again. And that's what these guys were always fighting against because when you're isolated, when you're set, when you're set apart, you're powerless. And that isn't just farmers, but it's, farmers is an easy example. Me as a farmer, I might raise 100,000 bushel of wheat, but that 100,000 bushel doesn't mean anything unless I put it together and collectively work with somebody else. So, so there's, a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot to be said about isolation today as compared to 100 years ago. In fact, I don't think they were as isolated as I am because as, as my equipment got wider, took a wider swath as the sprayer, whatever it is, takes a wider swath that pushes more people out and I have less contact with less people. And I think that's one of the things the populace, they didn't want that. They knew, they knew how important it was to work together and to cooperate. So, okay, let's go on. God, we gotta, I wanna keep moving. Miss Amanda Bates, I wanna talk about a few women in, in the movement. This young lady was a school teacher up North Central Kansas, is actually in Osborne County, Osborne Rooks line. And she was, she was elected the first woman president of a local which far, small farmers union group in the United States. So there, there it was. I mean, I, I think that's fantastic. In my home county, I, found, I, found, I learned about all these, these women and how much influence they had. There was a woman by the name of Nellie Klein, Nellie Klein Steenson. Her father was a frontier lawyer, but uh, she was uh, born December 7th in Leonard, Kansas. In 1912, she was admitted to the bar. In 1918, she was the first woman to present oral arguments before the Kansas Supreme Court from my hometown. Wow. And she was in the group of three or four of the first women to be elected to the Kansas House of Representatives, 1921 to 24. And she was the first woman to serve. She then moved to Idaho. So... There she is. And then Elizabeth Worrell Ball, another, she was one of the first teachers in the in, uh, uh, schoolhouse in, in Pawnee County. And um, she went to work, she was a correspondent for the Albuquerque Journal and the Kansas City Times and came back, was editor of the Leonard Chronoscope, then went to the Kansas City Times and the Kansas City Star. And eventually, 1980, or 19, 1891, she moved to Washington, D.C., where she worked for the Washington Star. In connection with this job, she became one of the first women admitted to the press gallery of the United States Senate, where she noted that her arrival was greeted, quote, with the enthusiasm of a case of smallpox. So, <laughs> but it, it, it goes on and on. And I, I'd venture to say, it, it can be Cedric County, it can be any county, if you if you had the time to, to look, you're going to find all these. We we tend to think of the populace. We don't think about the women involved in the populace, but but they were, they were. Okay, next slide. Um, is Kansas the greatest greatest cooperative state? And <clears throat> I've already talked about this quite a bit. But one really freaky thing. My daughter helped me. She puts my powerpoints together. I'm just I'm lazy. One thing, and I don't. I guess I I need to learn, but. She said, you realize, because this is from the Country Gentleman, which was a magazine of the time. She goes, I was looking at the date. She goes, 
That's dated September 18th, 1920. Today's September 18th, 2020. Exactly 100 years ago today. But Kansas Farmers Union started over 600 cooperatives in the state that particular year. Um, anyway, and then and, and along with cooperatives, you know, and one little sidebar note too is that the Federal Land Bank or you know Kansas, the, the ag credit thing you see on 96 Highway, the building, the first federal land bank loan made in the United States of America was made in Lonard, Can or near Lonard, Kansas. And um, just, and that evolved out of, out of work of, you know, efforts of, of farmers to get some kind of fair uh, interest rates and so on and so forth. In fact, I've, just about a year ago, I had the chance to go in that, the house still stands, a beautiful house. And um, so I've been there. So there are many other things. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Um, the difference between a, a cooperative and a corporation. And that, um, that goes back to this whole thing about, about the trust and, and the money. And if you go across like, okay, the cooperative, the nature of it, it's organized people. A corporation is organized capital. The purpose, to serve its members at cost on the cooperative, and on the corporation to serve the public for profit. And over here, each member has one vote and only one vote. And over there, you vote your, your money or your, your stock. And um, money is a servant of the people. And over here, uh, capital receives all the profits. Money is the master and goes back and forth. The results with the cooperative system, and this is a populist thing with the populist Wealth is equi equitably distributed among many, and the results of the corporate thing, wealth is centered in the possession of a few. So that, once again, the, and you see cooperatives all over Kansas. You know, you see all the, the ones we're familiar with are the big concrete structures. And to me, those are monuments to a lot of our populist movement. And we we've kind of lost our side of what it's all about but it but it, it was a tremendous feat what they pulled off um next slide kansas farmers union i'm kind of throwing in a plug here the 1915 convention my god that's a lot of people to be at the convention and uh, the legislative issues that that farmers union worked on over the years were in 1913, a graduated income tax, uh, 1916, right to vote, of course, 16 farm credit, voting records, packers and stockyards, which is a huge issue still today. We're still fighting that. 1924 to 28, the McNary Nagan Farm Bill never did pass, but that was the first farm bill ever attempted in the United States. And the AAA program was actually the first in 1933. But rural electrification, was a result, an outgrowth of populist movement of trying to get fairness and give opportunity. Just like today, we're trying to get broadband out in the country and it'll never happen left up entirely to the private sector, but it's always for the common good. We worked on the School Lunch Act. That was 1943 is when school lunches started. That's the populist I, thing. I might add yeah. that the first hot, hot lunch school program was started in Radium in uh, 1921, 22, somewhere around there. Cool. In the state. Yeah. There's stories everywhere and stories to be very proud of. And um, finally, I'll just briefly mention the public, public law 480, food for peace. And we won't go into any detail on that. Let me look at my notes here and then we'll go on to the next slide. Um, at this 1915 convention, Mrs. Cora G. Lewis spoke at that convention, gave a lengthy speech. She was the editor of the Kinsley Graphic, one of those great editors of a populist leaning newspaper. 19, let me see, I don't think I have a slide of it. In 1917, the convention was about that large, but you know who spoke at the Kansas Farmers Union Convention? President Woodrow Wilson. You, you talk about having some suck and some power. I mean, to get the president of the United States Come to your convention. He was coming through anyway, but that was right before World War One. This might have been late '16, and they were there was a big thing about the war starting. Um, 
Next slide, kind of projecting more populist ideas that what amounts to is even though the People's Party died and the populist party seemed to, to fade, we still have activities going on in, in the Farmers Union, which I'm familiar with as other organizations too. Some of the issues, and I highlighted a few of them, they were working still to get rural free delivery or postal service out in the country, which here we are back, back with the postal service, working on the white slave law, you know, um, packing houses, which is an issue right now we're dealing with, immigration, uh, pure food law, which actually is going to, is an issue now. Nobody knows it. Um, well, no, there are people know it, but wow, that one hasn't went away completely either. Child labor law, cooperative stores, and they had cooperative banks. Farmers Union started some banks, but they started them at the wrong time, about the time of the depression. So uh, next slide. And this is a button of, of uh, our organization. And like I said, I'm not here really to promote organization, except I'm trying to tie what the farmers movement and all these things, how they come together. FECU of A is Farmers Educational and Cooperative Union of America. So education and cooperation. And at the base, they had a basically a triangle uh, and the base was organization. So you had to be organized, you had to be educated, and you had to cooperate. Three really good rules that would really fit today if we just pay attention. Um, <clears throat> you know, Dornblazer, I come back to him because he had to, you know, he, I love this quote of his. He goes, there was nothing for those who began it, only the future. And in a way, that, that's a populist thing because I think populist, true populist, are always looking ahead. I mean, yeah, we're, we're trying to work on the, the issues of the day, but we're worried about that. We're, we're trying to create that future, create opportunity. And, and I think that's, that's what the, the populist movement is all about. Um, I just might add kind of to wrap my part of it up or some of it anyway, you know, I think the wonderful things that the, the populist movement and some organizations did was they created communities in all, all kinds of ways. They might've created a community around a cooperative, around all these things. They created schools, which created communities. And because there were none here and they knew the value of a community and the strength and the wealth and the wealth wasn't always financial. One of the interesting things I've, I've discovered, I, I shouldn't say discovered it, I've observed in my newspapers. And it's funny, I'll, I'll start looking sometimes in the 1890s for the heck of it or 1930s. Or somebody want me to look something up, but especially in the 1930s, the obituaries, um, in our particular paper, when somebody died, well, they kind of do it today yet, they have the little short thing because the paper was going out because it was weekly and say, you know, W.A. Gill died, da, 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 78 years old, whatever. But you, hmm? yeah, service is pending. But what I really like is, and I see more than not, the next week they tell their story and they talk about how it was born like in Pennsylvania and they moved to Illinois and then they, you know, come out here and what they did and different things. And rarely, probably never, do I ever see when they talk about how successful they were financially. What they to talk about is how they enriched their community, how their actions, like we helped, you know, he was instrumental in starting the, the school at, you know, Point View. In fact, there was, there, was a, there was a wonderful story that was written by a, a great aunt of one of my old landlords that's passed away now and talked about how they were starting a school. And these two women took from North Roselle took a, a wagon, a buckboard or whatever, and, and a couple animals, probably mules, went to town to get the, the door and a couple windows for the schoolhouse. And now it took them two days and they come back and just tell the story. And then they talk about how uh, um, it wasn't a huge thing, but we, it's the little part that we could do to make our place special and to have a school. 
And you read these things and they sound so simple. Maybe they are. But to me, when I when I look at this stuff and I see that, especially the, the outgrowth of, of populism and, and what those people try to do, when I read that, I feel I just immerse myself into my community. I feel like I just reached in and pulled something out of their heart and got to enjoy it and got to feel it just with them. Because they, were, they, they wrote many, I said this earlier, many beautiful essays and you have to search for these things. They're, they're not, they're not just right out in front, but, but um, again, I guess the other thing I'd say is that, that um, it proves to me as you, I mean, these things, people come and go and things come and go, but the issues stay the same. But, but if you're going to do something, do it, do it while you're alive, make a difference while you're alive and, and don't wait, you know, don't wait for, say, well, when I die, this will happen or whatever, because it probably won't. And no, no matter how special some people were, I always think about in Pawnee County, John Lewis and his sons, Joe and Walt, were world-renowned Paul Hereford breeders. They sold bulls in every continent but Antarctica. They'd travel with, in trains, you know, cars, and, and probably 25 years ago, Walt, the last one died, and then they sold a farm, and they had that beautiful spread. I bet there's people that are listening to this maybe today that that attended one of the the 4-H days out at Alfalfa Lawn Farms, and 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 it's it's gone. It's that is not there, but what is what does remain in our community? What they left behind was the most important thing was was opportunity for someone else. And that's, that's about all you can do is create op equal, op equal opportunity for people. So anyway, I think, I'd hope we have some questions and maybe, and I don't, uh, and we'll kind of go from there. You did perfect. Yeah. Let's thank him first, because I just think he did an incredible job. And I also feel like he presented information that you just can't find anymore. And so I really appreciate that. I'm hoping you guys have some questions and comments. Yes. Is there any chance I could get you to come up? Okay. And in the meantime, are there some short questions? Maybe, yes. And I can shout, I can repeat it, so. He, um, the question was how um, it was alluded that there was farmers concerned about packing plants and what those concerns were. Would that be fair? Okay. Okay. Let me answer that for you. Yes. Well, it's market concentration for one thing. It's economic power because there's three or four packers control like 85% of the beef packing poultry is even more huge. And we've seen just in this last year with, with the COVID issue, um, how these, the, the, the weak spots on this type of system, because people are crowded together. We had, we had an out, serious outbreaks there. And because of all this too, I mean, it, it's, it's a glitch in the system instead of having a diverse, spread out system it's very highly concentrated so if you have a problem you have a big problem plus like like poultry um, butchering the inspectors well now they're trying to be self-inspected these plants which that's terrible but there's like three birds a second that they got to be watching going by them to inspect well you can't inspect a bird in three three in a second and i'm not saying that's slow it way down but but it's, it's um, besides the economic pressure, it puts back on the farmer and rancher of captive supplies and of, of uh, market power domination. It's also, I think, a health risk. I mean, I don't know how serious it is because you can do different things. Um, you can dip them in something and, you know, kill germs. But 
I just, we just don't have to, in my opinion, we don't have to have that kind of a system. Um, uh, but this, this event that we went through the, the pandemic has, I think has, so to say, picked the scab off some, some issues and exposed them that maybe now we'll deal with. Uh, if that answers your question. Excellent. Martin, you had a question. Well, I had a question in the comments. Uh, the first question you meant the you showed on the slide up there among the accomplishments of the farm cooperations was uh, elim elimination and reduction of white slaver. And to what degree were the farmers involved with that matter? Well, I hope they weren't involved at all, but but they it was a social issue and they wanted to, they, they seen how wrong it was. And I think that's kind of an outgrowth of the populist thing because they, they, I mean, that, that's trafficking of people and, and um, that just wrong. So they, they were in opposition. I mean, they wanted to make their voice be heard that no, we're, we're a better society than that. We're better people than that. And even though it may not be happening right out in rural America, we think it's a big enough issue that, that we want to take a stand. Well, I understand that some of the children on the children's train ultimately were close to white slaves. Would that enter into this well, equation? You know, I never thought of that until you brought it up. But, but I could I could see how that yeah. I could see how it could happen. So Becky, maybe you want to address that more than me, but but tell them a little bit about the orphan trains, or maybe the orphan trains um, were. Uh, it was an idea that was created in like the late 1850s. It went up until the late 1920s. But essentially, what they would do, they had so many orphans in the large cities on the East Coast um, that there was an effort to um, to bring uh, some of these orphans out to the Midwestern states. Kansas was certainly one of them. Um, and they would essentially go from small town to small town on the railroad um, and bring these children out and people would uh, agree to, to take them. Uh, sometimes they were looking for farm labor. Um, they were looking for uh, people to do housework and, and things. And these were sometimes tiny little babies, tiny children. Some of them were teenagers. And sometimes they were misused. Um, it was primarily um, phased out by the 1920s. Um, there was um, there were some um, instances that the children had good good positive experiences. There is in Concordia. That is where the uh, Orphan Train Museum is. And if you ever get a chance, I highly recommend that you visit that. Um, in terms of also with the child labor, I might add, as a farm kid myself, I mean, I began driving when I was five, and by seven I was in the fields working. But that was just part of the family experience. I mean, you you all just kind of, and I think, because of that, I still know how to operate a chainsaw and all those things. That probably would not go over well today. I don't know. What do you think, Martin? Well, I would concur that uh, child labor laws were not on that list, and appropriately not. I uh, just wanted to comment. You, I, you, you, it resonated with me, your comment, to the degree that, at, that it was so important that we have cooperation among farmers in the 20s and the 30s. I was working on a little farm in Greenwood County in 1948. I was 14 years old and I was throwing bales up on top of the wagon all day long. Uh, the tractor was driven by the seven-year-old son of the, of, the, of the farmer. And the farmer was up on top and I'd throw the bales to him and then he stacked them more properly. Uh, but the, the, your comment that how, how it has changed. And of course we know that most rural counties in Kansas have lost population every 10 years. When I was 
I'm one of the last probably to have worked on a threshing machine. But for those of you that didn't know what threshing machines were really all about, first they would go through and cut the corn or the milo. Uh, and at the same time that it was being cut, it was bound by binder twine. And then the bundles fell on the ground behind. And us farm boys came behind and stacked those bundles up uh, with the heads up in the air so that it would continue to dry. Then subsequently, we came and took them out. We stacked them up in a, like a, looked like a teepee. Uh, subsequently, we came around, threw those bundles onto a wagon, maybe pulled by horses. Our far the farmer on our place had never had a tractor till he came to our place. He had two wonderful horses, which he kept forever, fed them all year long and used them maybe three or four days a, a year uh, in order to, he says, they'll pull us out of the mud better than a tractor will. <laughs> and they would. Uh, but then you, then you had... Then you had the threshing gang. And after, so you got them, you throw them on a wagon, you take them up to the threshing machine, which may have been run by a steam engine, or in my case, it was a Farmall M, which was bigger than the Farmall H that we had. And uh, you throw them on there and uh, it goes through and the grain goes one way and the, and the thresh Incidentally, that's where the name threshold came from. It's the stuff that comes off of the horse, uh, off of the grain. That's beside the point. <laughs> then, uh, the, oh, and it went from there. But the point was, it took a, we took all the neighbors together, and it was probably a crew of 12 or more people on that threshing gang to go out and pick it up and all the work involved with it. Now, one man drives a combine as you say very wide cuts more more grain harvests more grain in one day than our crew did and so that this change and you as you commented the smell of the land and so on if you were behind some horses you smell the horses and the land it's a different different world today in that air-conditioned cabin Thank you. That was yeah. excellent. Thank you so much. You know, what I, a great perspective. That is. And you talk about behind the mules and, and, and horses. They talked about that very thing about how when, well, two different things. The old timers would talk about how they fought, felt they were part of something more than themselves because they'd feel the surge of the horse or, and so on and so forth. But my dad always talked about if you were behind the mules or horses and and uh, he said, you'd be getting a little bit drowsy. He said, there, by accident, when I'm a little flatulence, he said, boy, that clear your mind up. You know, he said, you start thinking straight again. So, but uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's, and I think your point is exactly, I think you understood what I was saying. We, we lost contact with why we do it, what purpose, what we're out there. I mean, it becomes a, a commodity, not, it, it, it's, it's not food, it's a commodity. Well, and how neighbors worked together. together. That was the important thing. I mean, if you had equipment that your neighbor needed, oftentimes you would share and, mm -hmm. and or, you know, take it over, all of that. It's that isolation thing. I was going to, unless you have another question, I have something else I'm just going to quick go over because I've been thinking a little bit more about the grass roots and <clears throat> what that really means. And, you know, we talk about in, as farmers being grass roots but you know on, on plants the root really is a lot of times more mass than what's above the ground so that's i think we are deeply rooted so when when roots go down into the ground they they not only bring up what's needed but a lot of times the plant puts things back down and those roots grow and they don't care if there's a fence line here. They can grow underneath that. They can grow sideways, which is where our community should be. We shouldn't be divided that way. But then, you know, ultimately, I'm kind of shortening this up, this whole root thing. But, but you know, like a root will go along. If it hits an obstacle, it'll either go around it or try to split it or whatever. But it'll keep going. But when it dies, when that plant dies and those roots decay, they actually prevent 
they actually provide pathways for a lot of things. And that's what I see as a farmer being a grass, what I like to think as a grassroots farmer, that I put roots down like every other farmer has. And that when I'm dead and gone, I want to make sure that I have, that I've been very much grassroots, that my roots are going to provide opportunity and pathways for our next generation. So. Other yes, questions that, but, or comments? Yeah, yes. We have that lady there. I think that, I'm sorry, I didn't mean no. The India Oma um, Farmers Union sounds like it's Indiana and Oklahoma, but they're not close together. So uh, could you explain that? Okay. India, see, what is it? Was it 1905 when Oklahoma got to be a state finally? I think it's about 05. Really pretty late. O or Indi Oklahoma was divided in half. It was Oklahoma and India Homa. And then they combined went to make Oklahoma. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it wasn't, it, it was actually in, if you look on the old maps, that's what it was. And it was more Indian territory or a lot more resident Native Americans in India, Oma. Uh, I mean, a lot. And uh, so yeah, and it was, I'm sure it was 1905 is when they finally got statehood. 1907. Seven? Okay. Very good, thank you. So yeah. Anything else? Yes, Connie. How large is the farmer's union and, and compared to the past that they dwindled down like the regular unions have? Okay, she asked about the Farmers Union and membership. And it has dwindled down. It's about 200,000 members nationwide. Um, at its peak, you know, and people always make up numbers. I think probably at, at our peak, we were like 500,000 around 1920. And it's just because there's less farmers too. If you have 10% of the farm population as members, 10% of 2 million is a lot less than, you know, 10 and 10% of another number. So, yeah, and, and you bring up a good point there. Farm organizations are really kind of interesting to see how, what you don't see anymore is Farmers Union is a general farm organization. It's pretty rare. Farm Bureau, Farmers Union, and the Grange is kind of around yet. But what now you have commodity specific organizations. And a lot of that revolves around the fact that farmers are just too darn cheap to pay dues. So what do they do? They form these commodity groups like wheat and they check off at every sale like two cents a bushel for dues. But you don't really belong to that. But, but what it's done is led to the demise of the general farm organization. And in my opinion, even worse, those organizations now represent the commodity, but not the people. So when they go out, they say, we're going to sell more wheat. We're going to sell more beef. But they don't say anything about, we're going to make your community better. We're going to get a better price for you so your community can survive, so you can have businesses, you can have schools, you can have all these things. So, yeah, farm organizations are a are dying breed, like labor unions, same thing. And it's, it's, a, it's a very sad thing. But once again, uh, we've got into this mindset not just in agriculture, but agriculture is an easy thing to pick on that, you know, if I just raise a hundred bushel more than my neighbor, I'm going to beat him. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to come out all right. Or if, if my wheat makes 60 instead of 50. And what that really does is we, we're, we're growing in surplus of commodity and we're spending a lot of resources, water, fertilizer, all kinds of these resources to pr produce a crop in surplus. And once again, it isn't that collective idea that that all of the wheat farmers in the, in the Midwest have something in common. It's, it's a, once again, it's that isolation thing where you pull, th and this is what happened with, and I, I keep pulling all these issues back from the, the populist movement because they understood that by being isolated 
and distance for various rays, you were powerless. The only way you'd gain power is if you bound together some way. And cooperate is one way. And I'm sorry, I may, but the organization's small. I mean, relatively small. We're number two, but out of three, you know, but, but it's, it's an issue. People, and that's the other thing I've really noticed in the turn of the last century. And if you have another follow-up question, ma'am, if, if you have another follow-up question, I'll stop and let you ask it. No, I, I was just going to comment that. You got tired of listening to me? No, I was, um, I was a member of the uh, Steel Workers Union at Gas mm -hmm. Service. And I became a single mom and I worked in the office, which is non-union. And then I had a chance to get a metering job and I doubled my salary overnight. You talk about a miracle. Yeah. <laughs> so I am very pro union. So yeah. Good for you. What I was going to say about a hundred years ago, the fraternalism, when I looked in my newspaper, there were like a dozen fraternal organizations in Laundry, Kansas. I mean people wanted to be part of something larger than themselves. They they understood that I mean, they just wanted to be. They wanted to be a community. They wanted to be more, as opposed to now, we honker down in our own little area. You know, it used to, they always say it used to be that, you know, people had set out on the front porch and talked to their neighbors when they walked by. Now we sit in the deck and back and make sure nobody can see what we're doing. You know, I mean, it's just, just backwards. We, we become kind of antisocial in one sense. And farmers are... You know, and for farmers, it's easy to get isolated. And isolation is unhealthy. Mentally, physically, community-wise, there is nothing positive about isolation unless you have COVID. But. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, any other questions or comments? Yes. Uh, did you find anything about what the text of President Wilson's speech was to the Farmers Union? Well, it had to do a lot with, what was the term they used about and not wanting to get into war? I can't think of it off the top of my head. Um, anyway, we were anti-war. Right. I, well, it was isolation. There was another term I'm trying to think of. And he spoke to that. He was out in the Midwest trying to basically, in a roundabout way, saying, kind of letting people know, well, we're going to be going to war here pretty soon. And you know, we weren't going to, we weren't going to stand for it. Okay. And that's, that's what he was out here doing. And uh, the farm vote was a, a huge vote back then. Yeah. I mean, it, it was a big chunk of the, and you know, you re, when you think about who was out here, I mean, most of the people that were alive then were probably immigrants and you're going to go to war and you're going to shoot your first cousin over there. Maybe, you know, you weren't real excited about that whole thought process of going to war against your home, your motherland. I mean, that's just my opinion, but. Okay. That's, yes. That, that's all I had. Yeah. And there's always been the, the whole farm issue. I, and I, other... I apologize if I've taken this a little bit wrong direction, but I don't. No, you did perfect. Um, any other questions or comments? Well, you guys, let's, let's thank Tom and, um, I think he did a fantastic job. Next week, uh, we're going to be looking at the rise of public health in Kansas um, from the very beginnings and, and uh, the movements that were associated with that. Look forward to it. Um, see you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.